Terrible noise. I don't have a oh, okay. Eyes, Let's get started. Welcome to the Issaquah City Council okay. Committee work session this Monday, January 12th, 2015. I got to write that time. We have one item on the agenda. Uh, it is known as concurrency. And uh, this is a topic we're all very familiar with. And um, Tonight we're going to start with uh, Development Services Director Charlie Bush will be um, presenting to us kind of an executive summary and overview and I really expect and hope that um, this frames conversation that we can have you know, during his presentation. And uh, after that part of the, of the, um, of the meeting, um, then I'm, uh, there's three sections within the packet. There's policy section, there is uh, ordinance section, and there is the uh, code amendment section. And uh, I'm gonna do, gonna wanna do a check with everybody because in the end, the ordinance and the, and the uh, code amendments, you know, are what get enacted and our policies drive that. And this, is, this really is um, uh, our best opportunity to date uh, you know, to, there, no question should go unasked. No, no point of view should go unshared. Um, I, um, I'm most interested in having a good, lively conversation. Uh, uncertainty, doubt, question, now's the time to, to bring them up. And, and let's talk about them now. Uh, because the decision in front of us is whether or not this package is ready for action a week from tonight. Um, I hold um, the, um, the option available that maybe it's not, uh, but um, that would have to be born, you know, based upon our conversation and, and other things that we learn here tonight. So, but the current plan is to have it on the agenda a week from tonight, but um, let's see where this goes. And again, I really, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you many times, everybody here, uh, if you have questions, if you have concerns, uh, let's get them out and let's discuss them. So, you know, with that introduction, before I turn it over to Charlie, does anybody want to make a speech before we get started? <laughs> There's your chance. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Charlie? We're back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right. You'll recall this process started a couple of years ago, actually back in 2013 continued through all of last year, and potentially, as Council President Winterstein was mentioning, could conclude this month. Uh, it's included an open house that we had back in, I believe it was November, and numerous council work sessions. We actually looked back, we appeared at half of your work sessions last year, in addition to many, many, many committee meetings. So if a work session happens in February, Dave and I will not know what to do with ourselves, uh, having an open evening. <laughs> Nor will Randy, he'll actually be able to do something for somebody else. So why are we here? I just wanted to go back to the original purpose. And one of them is transportation is the top concern of the community. This is the, the perspective of the administration. Um, it's an action item in the central plan. This, is, uh, this was a follow-up item in the central plan to go look at parks and traffic impact fees. And, uh, and also we did the Burke study during the central plan process and that looked at fiscal impacts of that plan. And within that, there were some very large numbers uh, that you may recall. And so this isn't really a surprise to us that we're back here talking to you about these things at this point in time. We also needed to update our parks and traffic impact fees. They were due for an update. They've been due for an update. Um, ideally, you do that every three to five years. It had been six and eight years, I recall, um, on those studies. So it was definitely time. And of course, we passed the central plan. So we have updated numbers. and. Um, that since our last update. And so all of our models got updated, traffic numbers got updated, development has occurred. A bunch of circumstances have changed uh, that bring us to this point. Lastly, we saw the opportunity to streamline concurrency, to change the process of how we do concurrency. In other words, how development, as it relates to, to traffic impacts in particular, how it occurs um, concurrent by state law within six years, uh, how, how those impacts are mitigated and simplified concurrency uh, is the process that we've talked with you about. It allows us to look at things from a system perspective, to have a high-performing system, as opposed to studying each development's impacts on specific intersections. 
and try to make sure that those specific intersections remain high performing. So it's a <laughs> philosophy change in the way that we do this and it streamlines things, makes it easier for developers and potentially makes it easier for us to accomplish our vision. Yes. Okay, thank, uh, thanks for that. So, so I just, it may seem like an obvious question, but that first bullet, does anybody want to dispute that? It's a top concern. Does any, is it just is, so I mean, we put a lot of time and energy, and I think it re, the proportionate amount of time we're putting into this have already, and we'll be putting into it over the course of this year, just uh, mobility in general. I mean, it is a reflection of not only this council, but also our community's belief that, uh, you know, something we need to address traffic in Issaquah. Is anybody, so, so I just, I just want to make sure, I mean, everybody's with me, right? Okay. That this is a top issue that we need to do something about. All right, thank you. Nina, yeah. Well, go back, so having a high performing system is an interesting phrase. When you're saying, is there anything to be debated here? Okay, sure. Having a high performing system, one thing that's been occurring to me over these deliberations is the difference between a suburban um, transportation system or even a rural you know, transportation system and one that's urban. And we're looking ahead at a 2030 plan where it's a cause quite urban. But what does high performing mean in an urban setting is, is still something I'm grappling with. I'm just throwing that out there as you're asking for. So that's just an open question just, in your just mind. A, just a comment, just, just a reflection on the comments here. All right, thank you. All right, I, I would it's at least submit somewhat of an answer to that, which it, it means what we think high performing is to us. So it really, if, you know, if we determine that we want a certain outcome from the system, then high performing would be getting that outcome. Yeah, it's very open. It is. Some key factors, some things I just wanted to mention that have been underlying this whole process, particularly as we talk about uh, the transportation system. We're in a growing urban region, so we're not in a situation where we're geographically isolated from, from neighbors, and so we have regional traffic. We have a lot of things that are outside of our control that impact our community. We have geographic constraints. We have mountains, and we have very narrow transportation corridors uh, where, where traffic really is funneled because you can't go other ways. We also have a very large lake in Lake Sammamish. So there, there's some real restrictions there. We have all these intersecting regional corridors and many of them go to I-90. And I-90 really from a traffic modeling perspective is a magnet for trips. People want to get to I-90, there's capacity there. It's the way to get to work in, in a lot of cases or the way to get to transit service and that type of thing. So. Uh, the, the result of that is, is been historically for us that we've had a lot of regional traffic. We continue to have a lot of regional traffic. And when you look at the way we've modeled all this and you, you start looking at the fiscal impacts, about 70% of the fiscal impacts are the result of regional traffic. Now, there is an upside to regional traffic and the big upside for us historically has been our retail base. When you have a lot of traffic, retail is attracted to those types of environments because the opportunity for customers going by your door and as a result, we've done very well with sales tax over the years. We've had a good commercial base. The downside, of course, is you have more cars out there and you have more congestion, potential for congestion. And as we heard from Torsten's presentations previously and from Randy's as well, trips that start or end here are not trips that we have a real feasible way of charging uh, their impact on our street systems. That's a downside. It's just, some, it's just a reality for us as we have this regional traffic and we've got to grapple with it as we try to maintain a level of service that we determine means high performance for us. The Growth Management Act is out there. You know, all the planning we do, you'll hear about growth targets in a little bit. Um, the fact that we're in this region, that we have growth targets allocated to us, we have certain constraints in the way that we go about doing this whole process. Even levels of service are directly out of the Growth Management Act. And so the context in which we operate in all of this is, is within state law. And so. Uh, our, our decisions are somewhat limited, and I'll talk a little bit about, well, what if we didn't grow uh, a little bit later in this presentation? And then the burden for funding government is really shifting. It's just something to think about. From the federal level, there are a lot of things that have historically been funded that, that aren't necessarily being funded at the same rate. The state level, we've certainly heard a lot about the state's budget issues, and, uh, and those are continuing. And so what you see is um, unfunded mandates or things just not being done that used to be done that are all falling down to us at the local level and we need to deal with those. And across the country, cities are stepping up to deal with those. Yes. You know, on, on the regional traffic, I just want to be clear when we say regional traffic, you know, we, we talk about it like it's this 
great mass of vehicles that just appears on our roads and clogs them up and then disappears after rush hour. When we say that it's 70% of the total fiscal impact, are we literally talking about vehicles that are going from, say, Sammamish to Renton and just passing on through? Or are we talking about the regional trips that originate or end in our city but are not staying within the city, so in essence they become regional? Talking about those that do not start or end here, so they just pass through. I could have called them pass-through trips. Because I think it's, it's an important distinction yes. because when we say regional going somewhere outside the city, um, by adding more development in the city, we are increasing the amount of trips that will originate or terminate outside the city as well. No question that we are in an interconnected region. We have impacts on, on neighboring jurisdictions and they have impacts on us. And that's part of the challenge and the opportunity here. So growth targets, I mentioned this a little bit in, in relation to the Growth Management Act. Through the Puget Sound Regional Council in this, in this region, in this area, there's a regional allocation pro a process. It's happened a couple of times uh, and it will continue to happen as a part of state law where we're, we're given employment targets, we're given uh, population targets, and we have to find a way to plan for those. And through the passage of the central plan, uh, we did that. And in fact, in the residential, we bumped it up even a little bit beyond our growth target uh, to have the opportunity to become a regional growth center. And with the regional growth center, we ran some numbers because you've seen there's an over $300 million total set of projects. And within that, it's over $80 million in, in grants that we have anticipated we could receive. Um, of that, 50 million of the 80 plus million uh, is a direct result of being a regional center should we get that des designation this year, which is certainly something we're pursuing. We meet the criteria, we expect that will occur, and that's a key part of this plan. So that's one-sixth of the total, one-sixth of the 300 million. It's a very significant uh, amount. In addition to that, and I'm asking for some more detail from Metro to help us if, see if we can quantify this, additional transit service. Regional growth centers receive additional transit. It's one of the criteria that Metro looks at and Sound Transit looks at for providing transit service. And so we're getting that, but certainly having more density has bigger potential for ridership. And it's, it's one of the key things that we've built into our plan with the central plan. So we've decided to grow in this way. We've decided to grow in a responsible way if you want to look at it from a sustainability perspective because we're encouraging people to live, work, and play in the same area. We're encouraging people to not have a lot of single occupancy vehicle trips. Uh, we've looked at the mode split, which we talked about previously, but the number of, or the percentage of non-single occupancy vehicle trips that we put into our modeling, uh, and for model run three, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that was a 10% increase. That's, that's a goal of ours. That's something we're gonna have to work towards, and with the um, walk and roll plan and other projects that we've, we've uh, put in place that we're looking at funding through this plan, we have the opportunity to meet those goals. Neighborhood preservation is another key. So we've, we've looked at growing in a dense mixed use way in the central plan and instead of as assuming growth or accommodating growth by upzoning other areas of our community. Uh, and so, we, so we're preserving existing neighborhoods as best we can and hopefully bringing in uh, additional revenue so we can even enhance those, those neighborhoods and our overall services. And lastly, the comprehensive plan. You're gonna hear from Trish very soon in our major update of our comp plan uh, about growth targets that are all, of course, worked into our comp plan, but that's a great place to talk about our overall overarching community growth plans. So that's sure. a great place for that conversation, yes. So do you have any, uh, or is it in our material? It may, might be, I just don't recall. Um, this regional allocation, um, uh, I know we can look at different time horizons into the future, but um, could you just share with us any actual numbers, both um, what would have come and then how and, how, and what we added to that with our uh, Central Issaquah Plan and our uh, Regional Growth Center designation? Yeah, Trish, yeah, do you wanna help out with that? Trish is my good luck charm. Nobody ever asks about growth targets until now yeah, when Trish comes along. Well, this is why she's here. Right. Um, it actually is in your um, huge stack of information, okay. um, and I will turn to it just so I don't get the numbers wrong. Um, our, our targets for 2031 were 7,750 additional housing units. Could you tell us where it is in that? Uh, I'm looking at the Tuesday, December 2nd the agenda. Page? 
Um, the packet? And it's, I have it's page it. six. It's the one with the chart on it? Yeah, and then we'll, we'll change it to this. We'll translate it's that. It's in the to question and answers. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's at the top of that. So in today's packet, it's page 45 of 290 in the PDF version. And it's page six of the QA document. And it's question. It's above the charts. Check question two, I two. believe. Question two. Did everybody find it? That wanted to find it, and it's we took uh, 200 more additional units because, pardon, 2,000. Oh, is that 2,000? Um, and but we took less jobs than we needed to, um, 775 less than our growth targets was the final central plan, and that again was to be um, eligible to be a regional center. So, so the the seventy seven fifty mm -hmm. uh, increase in um, in housing units that is uh, we, so what what's the no action what, what if we hadn't what would, what would the number have been otherwise well we would have still had to accommodate that between two thousand and six and twenty thirty one it just they we're allowed to choose where we're going to accommodate it by either up zoning or down zoning or or whatever we choose to do. For example, we could have put it in Park Point, but we chose not to. We chose that that was a really good spot to, to keep natural, and so we worked on ways to do that. Um, we felt that, that downtown on either side of I-90 was a perfect spot for housing opportunities and mixed use because of I-90, because of the transit opportunities, because there's no housing there now. Um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't change any of the existing neighborhoods to put it all in the center area there. Um, so that was sort of the public process we went through with the community is where would you like these these new homes that we have to accommodate in the next 20, 20 years? So thank you. That, ask, that answer is where. What, 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 what would have been the allocation without the growth center designation? That is the allocation. That was before so we were thinking about it. We received that allocation. That's not what it says on the document. It says the central plan allows for 7,750 Additional housing units, which, oh. is, which is more than our growth target. Right. I'm sorry. So the, I think the answer to Paul's question is 5750. Right. It's the num. It's the previous number, the the 2000 less. Thank you, Stacy. Okay. I so 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 and, and so that's citywide. That's not just within the. Correct. Yeah, so, Correct. So. And we're allowed to choose as a community where we would put those, just like the other couple of growth targets sessions that we've taken, the community decides where to put it through the comprehensive planning process. So we were looking at 57, we would have been looking at 57.50. Right, and 20,000 jobs. In 20,000. In 20,000 jobs. Yeah, well, just, 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 right. just housing right now. So we would have been looking at 57.50. We're looking at 2,000 more. So what's the rate? That's about a 30 percent. 30% increase. And it's done with infill with higher density uh, in an area least impactful to existing neighborhoods. I mean, that's right. the, that's a big part of the vision of this, of the central area. Plan. Right. And, and, and so, and I'm just, I just think it's really important to have these proportion. You know, we're talking about a slate of projects for growth to help us fund. And I think, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, I think we'd be having a quite a different conversation if we were talking about 5750. Right. The, the issue is, and that we came up with um, when we were talking to the community, everyone was asking, where would we put the next set of growth targets? And that's a valid question because, you know, our annexation areas are built out with the villages. There aren't a lot of areas left. And so we started thinking if we had to be proactive now and have that regional center and keep growing in the middle where there's no, where we're not going to affect the existing neighborhoods, why wouldn't we do that instead of making a plan and then four years down the road, oh, you have to take another 3,000 housing units and how many ever jobs, and we wouldn't really have a really good place to put them. So being on the urban growth line and being very strong about holding and not going into the rural area like some other communities try to do, we knew we had to make the best of the land that we have for the targets that we, we're receiving now and that we're going to receive in the future. Okay, thank you. I just just the picture I'm trying to get. I'm, 
uh, is is just that of you know the alternative of having not adopted these growth targets. Uh, we still know that there's uh, significant significant growth, and I think coupled with uh, your <coughs> comment early, Charlie, about you know what just the growth center designation makes us at least make, makes us eligible for up to you know that you know, that additional funding. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. we don't know what the slate of projects would be and what the costs would be if we didn't have the, these type of plans. And I think, you know, that is something that uh, it would be interesting in the time remaining if we could get some kind of idea of that. I think we've already discussed that. So, okay, thank you. Ask a question. Yeah, Nina. Uh, Tristan. Sure. So on that same page, uh, there's a chart below that a bar chart that's uh, showing existing residential units, mm -hmm. 2013 and then the 2030. Mm -hmm. And the difference between those numbers is over 10,000 residential units. And, and the reason I bring it up is that what I wondered is where is the number of how many residential units we have right now? Um, that number's in the comp plan. Um, these are were used for the traffic model. And I think, Dave, did they come right out of the EIS that we did for Central? That's what I'm thinking. I think that's why the numbers don't completely add up specifically to the the, the numbers that were the finalized numbers that we took, um, because in the I don't know if you recall in the EIS we actually had the two alternatives, one that had higher housing and lower jobs, and one that was the opposite. And then we chose the one that had the higher housing units and less jobs, in it. And so I think that's the these numbers. On, and if Torsten were here, he could correct me if I was wrong, but I think these numbers come from the, um, the EIS that we did. But speaking of the how many we have now, we started actually, um, if you will, monitoring how many housing units we were adding in 2006, because that's when the growth, um, the growth target started. And so we had a, a certain amount of them before we adopted the central plan, and that number's actually in the central plan to show that all of them don't have to be done by the central plan, that there was already some that were in the hopper, if you will, before we adopted the central plan. Okay. I can get the number for you for the next time you guys meet. Well, if, the reason I bring like it up is just to clarify what the growth really means. Paul pointed out the difference between two different options in growth. One would be to take on the Growth Management Act requirement, and the other would be to go for the regional growth center. Um, and proportionally, those two compare to one another, but how does it compare to what we already have? And helps paint the picture. Okay. Well, we would have, um, if we hadn't adopted the central plan, we would have just done the 5,000 um, just through rezoning different pieces and parts. And we felt as a community when we would go through and do the open houses and the asking of the community what they thought, we weren't getting a lot to put all 5,000, you know, because we didn't get the, the regional center designation, Alec. You know, we didn't meet any of the, the targets that would have gotten us an extra bonus, um, if you will, from state grants and other um, PSRC funding. And so we thought, geez, we're, we're growing so much and we're not getting anything. If we just took like the next set of growth targets, we could actually start paying for it, be eligible to pay for some of the infrastructure now, is what the thought was. Thanks. Anything else? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd mention one other thing on this slide, is, which is the fourth bullet down, which, which is, if you think about this with the regional growth center designation, bumping up those uh, residential units to get to that level, uh, there's a lower incremental cost for those than there is for the rest of the, the planned development because of the that we're able to leverage because the additional transit service and how that relates to mode split, which means fewer cars on the road, which means fewer projects. There's a real uh, a benefit to that, so I, I just wanted to make sure I made that point before I moved on. Well, and yes. I want to I want to reiterate that I've been thinking about that quite a bit, and this is one thing I've asked them to do some research on is that, and this is this is a this is a big ask of information, but you know from a from a citizen's perspective, what's the like the per capita or per one thousand dollars of value property value you have? What's the what's the different burden city share? on our residents with a growth center versus not growth center. Um, that's, you know, we didn't model that. Uh, we didn't, because we had it in our plan, we didn't, we didn't not model. 
uh, uh, none, of our, none, of, none of our runs did, uh, did that in this concurrency thing. But I think it's a very interesting question. And I, as a citizen and a property owner myself, if I'm considering or hearing about different potential uh, you know, d uh, proposals, you know, and, and I'd very much like to know, you know, what's the burden to me uh, between the two options? And I mean, I think that's an interesting way to, to cast this because, because, you know, I think what, at least what I've been hearing, and one of the reasons, uh, you know, I'm very interested in this route that we're on right now is that, uh, is that um, there's very, that any type of improvement to a top city issue, that being transportation, would very likely be much higher per capita via kind of a non-growth center route. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you just said. <laughs> Same thing Charlie just said, but my own words. So, but this is what I've been thinking about, is that, is that there is, by, by doing the extra planning that we have for growth, both population and jobs, uh, does avail, uh, we have to build more projects, uh, and, but it, and it does also avail us to significantly uh, more um, non-city dollars. So, and so, but so what would be the per capita city share in the no growth or the non-regional growth center plan versus the regional growth center plan? So it's like those. So it's like you know, it's like those extra two thousand dwelling units. Just they are not weighted the same. They're of tremendous value to us. We we're talking about leveraging an investment. They're a tremendous value. I don't know what that ratio is, but I think that would be very, very powerful. By just kind of thinking about it, and I and I don't have a calculation on this. My sense is is that that they that that because they have such higher weighted value. Uh, to us when it comes to the access to regional funding, the net, you know, kind of per capita burden is probably less. And that's just a theory. Um, I hopefully we can get some more information. Nina? Yeah, I think that's uh, um, interesting, and I, I appreciate what you're saying, but it is very speculative to say it that way without um, working it out. But then, furthermore, how, how far could you go with that speculation when just moments ago we said that I-90 was a big draw to regional traffic and causing... Um, congestion on our roadways, we'll put a, a train station in here and, and just wait and see how much regional traffic we might be able to attract along with our roadways if we do it, if we have that. So a regional growth center will present a different outcome as well, and it's something that's been considered here. It may cost less, it may impact more. Still kind of speculative and, they, on, and weighing, weighing which thing matters more. Still an interesting discussion. I would like to know much different per capita it is. Okay. I agree. Thanks, Charlie. All right, one more thing to add, which is, I was just talking to Trish over here. By 2030, we expect another round of growth targets to come through. And so whatever additional uh, residential we've looked at, we're likely, those will get picked up in the next round of growth targets. So we're, we're sort of ahead of the game going into the next round for what it's worth. Policy direction. So now we're, we're going from big global picture more down to this specific discussion. And I wanted to repeat back to a little bit of what we've heard. First thing I wanted to mention is, uh, and there's, there's been some talk out there uh, about the exercise we're going through. This is a very common exercise for cities to go through. The simplified concurrency element of it is certainly a little bit more unique, but it's been done in other communities as well. But the stuff's all legally defensible, it's all consistent with GMA. Uh, and it's a common approach in our state. And, we have experts that we've hired to help us with tons of experience. And so I just wanted to start out by saying that, mainly for the viewing public, uh, just so folks have that context. Uh, the, the policy direction we believe we've heard from you, Council, is very consistent with staff recommendations over time, but it's been an iterative process. You know, we've come to you and said, what do you think? This is what we recommend. We've checked and we've made tweaks along the way. And as you're probably familiar with at this point, we have a very big policy sort of decision matrix that we've set up that, uh, that I'll refer to in just a second here. Uh, level of service for the viewing public. Uh, this is the concept, and Randy, I'm sure, will jump in here if I bungle this, but I've heard him say it enough times, I think I have it down. Basically, level of service is delay time at intersections. It's the way we measure it under the Growth Management Act. And A, it's like report cards. A is really good, F is really bad, everything in between is a spectrum. 
We're currently at level of service D. That's not uncommon in our region. And as communities become more urbanized, the level of service tends to drop. It's just a result of being in an interconnected region. Uh, as density increases, traffic increases, et cetera. We're proposing to drop slightly to weighted level, uh, to weighted average D, which means that we're dropping a few of the intersections below uh, D, but overall as a community, if you did a weighted average, we'll remain at D. That's the policy direction we believe we've heard from council to date. Model run three, I mentioned model runs. We did a no action alternative, basically. We looked at what if we did nothing. We looked at building out our, our uh, full, uh, transportation improvement program. We ran a model, model run two, that looked at trying to fix everything with roads and had a, a mode split that wasn't um, as, as uh, bicycle and pedestrian friendly and non-SOV friendly as model run three. And model run three was really a, kind of a, a compromise place, kind of a, a spot where we found uh, that the things that seemed to be of interest to the council as we shared these with you, kind of all came together and we were listening throughout this process and figuring out how to run model run three. So we do have higher levels, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation of non-SOV, non-signal occupancy vehicle trips, assumed in their carpools, van pools, bicycle trips, uh, pedestrians, and we've done the walk and roll plan. You recently approved that. Uh, that addresses uh, at least providing the infrastructure for the bicycle and pedestrian trips at a more significant level. And every project from that plan that would qualify for uh, being a part of the, the mitigation fee, uh, we've, we've tried to fund with that, at least the, the portion that we could fund with it. Uh, so we're addressing uh, that goal as a part of this. And in addition, the regional growth center, additional transit service and other things we're doing also will play into that. Uh, the projects that are in here, you'll recall we went through a process where we looked at the whole TIP and there were some projects that just didn't have the cost benefit attached to them that, uh, that, that we would all expect. And so uh, Torsten, working with Sheldon, uh, removed a number of projects to get us to model run three and to try to bring the cost uh, to, to a very good place, uh, as, as good as it could be, given the cost benefit ratios on, the, on each of the individual projects. And so we really did our due diligence, worked our way through that, and landed on model run three. Yes. Marlene, I just wanted to share and uh, bring up now because I want to talk about it later that uh, I think it's interesting now and this has been such as Paul had said at one of our meetings a fire hose of information and sometimes and this has been sitting here since last July but I didn't even really read it until now because I was reading so many things on page 52 of our packet there's a really nice chart about the LOS summary by alternative and I, I just want to bring it up now because it shows that our existing level of service uh, has over 77% at levels A, B, or C. You know, we keep talking about the weighted average D and then how many <coughs> intersections we let go to F and, and all that sort of thing. And so this got way past me that right now, uh, level of service A, B, or C, which are quite high performing um, intersections, we have 77%. And even with le um, uh, model run three, we'll have 60% at a, B, or C to get to that weighted level D. It's not like all intersections are a D. So I think it's it's worth looking at that as we are um, exploring this um, transition to an urban center. Just it's important to mention we didn't even go there uh, in this discussion. We did, there, there, you could have, had you wanted to, we could have talked about raising the level of service, but you can imagine given where we are from a numeric perspective, raising the level of service would have meant a tremendous dollar amount and would have been really challenging. I have a feeling if Torsten modeled that, he would have been showing large roadways that would have partly filled with regional traffic and it would, it's almost impossible to build your way out. So this is just where we are uh, as a region and uh, it's a good observation, yeah. The way it is currently, it's certainly not, not going to stay there with what we're looking at. Additional policy direction, we talked about the non-motorized fee. This helps fund, as I mentioned again, those walk and roll projects in addition to some other bicycle and pedestrian projects. Uh, the non-residential parks impact fee, in other words, we've had a residential park, residential development parks impact fee for some time, but we've heard from you that uh, you are interested in the non-residential fee that we've put in front of you as well. Uh, it's important to mention that fees do not apply to change of use. Currently in the city, there is an impact fee that's paid when uh, landlord rents out a building for commercial use uh, to somebody new. 
and uh, that will no longer be the case. So uh, if you have an existing building, this is a, something that should help ease of business and certainly ease of administration on our end as well. Uh, the simplified predictable process. This is really helpful for developers. You'll recall there'll be a, a calculator on our website. Anybody be able to go if they've got a development and uh, they know what type of development it is, they'll be able to plug some information in our website and find out instantaneously uh, how much it would cost them from an impact fee perspective to develop here. That's as opposed to the current system of contacting us, having us model it with Torsten and CH2M Hill, and then they would typically, if it's a large development, hire their own traffic consultant. We'd have dueling traffic consultants, and uh, in the end, we would try to figure something out that would work, but often um, it, w it, was, it was a frustrating process for both sides, and so this allows us to get quite a bit further down the road. Uh, there's an extensive list of discussion items, that policy matrix I mentioned, so there's a lot more, I'm just giving you and all of that direction led us to the code uh, that we have in front of you that's really the action item um, for this agenda bill. So the question's been out there a little bit, and I, I thought I would address it. What if we didn't grow at all? And I've addressed it a little bit already, but the Growth Management Act really in this region requires us to grow, and so if we wanna stay consistent with the Growth Management Act, we really don't have a choice. In addition to that, we have development agreements that are already in place that have vested development included in them. So we're committed to that growth, and that's a significant percentage of our overall planned growth. If we didn't grow, we would have limited additional revenues to build improvements. There wouldn't be impact fees, uh, the ones that we're talking about uh, coming in. So, th so that would be definitely a challenge. Uh, and it, it would also affect our you know, potential future ability to raise tax revenues. Because you'll recall, even with the property tax, the way it's assessed or calculated is always um, our total assessed valuation in the community plus new construction. Well, if you take new construction away, then um, you're really struggling to, to build any kind of property tax base. Uh, we would struggle to maintain our level of service. We've got regional traffic coming in. We have limited revenues. We can't really build, build projects very well. And uh, ultimately, uh, we're gonna have to take a look at our level of service anyway um, and have a big uh, public funding discussion about that, uh, just to either maintain our level of service or um, let it go and, and continue to drop it. And so the, the point is regional traffic's there no matter what. Yes. So I was looking back to try to figure out when we approved all this growth. And it was, it was even before the central area plan. And I was shocked because I was on the council in 2010, and I was shocked to discover that in April of 2010, we approved on a consent calendar a resolution which authorized the adoption of the county's GMA requirements, which set forward the 5,000 housing units and the 20,000 jobs and that sort of thing. I don't remember ever talking about it. It looks like it was plopped on a consent calendar and we approved the resolution. And this was in April of 2010, so this is, you know, almost five years ago. I don't remember much discussion leading up to that. So I guess my question is, and I'm not saying no growth per se, but I'm saying, what is the mechanism by which that can ever be revisited? I mean, are we just locked in stone here that we are adding 20,000 jobs and thousands of housing units and there's just, we've reached the point of no return or do we have to go back to the county if we decided to revisit that and have them reopen the book? How, how does that all work? Trish will speak to the process. Yeah. Right, to answer your first question, by the time it got to PSRC to put it in, or the regional um, by the time the numbers got to GMPC to put in the King County wide policies, the jurisdictions had already adopted them in their comprehensive plans. So we would have already as a community adopted them in the comprehensive plan in the population chart in the level of service for capital facilities. So you would have seen that and planning policy commission would have seen it in their public hearings before it even went to the King County wide policy. So that's why it was on the consent agenda because it was already in our comprehensive plan and it seemed odd to have a discussion about something that you had already approved in the comprehensive plan. That's why it was a consent agenda. But um, the process would be if a jurisdiction can't make the targets or having troubles making the targets, 
those we try to get those out in the open when we're all negotiating who gets to take which targets. Obviously, cities like Sammamish try to get more. Um, you know, they would like to get more jobs, but they know they're probably not going to get more jobs, so they usually get higher housing targets. And so there's a lot of negotiation that goes through the um, the East Side cities. Um, if you, if you can't make your targets, there aren't a lot of troubles that you get into yet, like there's no sanctions or um, they don't take away your money for different things, but they look poorly on you when you do go out for grants and, um, and are trying to qualify for things because they feel that you haven't done your jurisdictional duty to try to help with everybody, you know, that you know, all the boats are supposed to go out. Um, but there aren't any you know, sanctions or anything like that yet. But um, they do get renegotiated every couple of years. I think this last one we had was either five or seven years. I think it was seven years because of the recession. No one wanted to talk growth targets during the, the, the bad years. But I'm sure that there'll be another set of growth targets that we'll have to negotiate between now and the next, you know, 2030, op, you know, obviously. But then we'll all be at the table again saying, you know, how well did you do? Uh, the, another interesting story that you might like is we did so well when the Highlands came in and we went over our targets that a lot of the East Side cities were asking us to take more for that next time. And we said, no, just because we're doing well doesn't mean we want everything. And so the next time then we didn't, we, you know, we just took the minimum. But then this time, though, it, it looked like it was better for us to take more or to, to have more sort of as a buffer for when the next targets come out. So it all depends on where the city is when the targets are being negotiated. So does that help? It, it does. And just to follow up then, so by doing a trip bank that's based on those targets, right, 8,400 trips available is based on these adopted target levels. So when the time comes to renegotiate if there's a sea change and a souring on that level of, of added growth you then go back and you just say well now now we're going to just reduce the amount of trips in the bank that's basically right. just just how that works at that point I just i'm nodding my head but for the public who's watching on the record um yes the, 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 we've talked about the every two to three year review whatever happens in that interval, whether our growth skyrockets or it tanks and whether the region skyrockets or tanks, all of those become variables. But to your specific hypothetical, if we found that we had a substantial reduction in our anticipated growth and we wanted to revisit our commitments to future, we would also have to revisit the trip bank. We wouldn't be just authorizing more trips when we are not authorizing under the underlying development and the underlying transportation improvements. A little bit no, more on uh, no growth here. So th there would be impacts to the overall quality of life. Um, just from the things I mentioned previously, we'd be out of GMA compliance. Uh, it would affect our ability to win grants ultimately, and uh, partly because we wouldn't be a regional growth center, amongst other things. Diminished regional relationships, as Trish mentioned, and ultimately a community in decline. One of the things that's really clear across the state, and AWC's written a bunch about this as well, is if communities are not growing in our state, uh, they're in decline. Uh, you, you really can't stay the same. Uh, and it's, it's due to the way the revenue systems are set up and a whole variety of other things. Public share. So that's another one I thought I would address uh, for a moment because I know this is a key concern for folks. So, I know Randy likes the first bullet a lot. Uh, it's absolutely true. So the simplified concurrency doesn't work without the public share. We've, it's something we absolutely have to step up and do sooner rather than later. Uh, we've got to got to get it resolved and uh, and get moving on building projects if that's what we're going to do and continue on with our plans. Uh, we're going to have to have significant public involvement in this, and it's going to require at least one vote, depending on what uh, form of revenues or. Uh, sources you decide uh, are, are the best uh, should we move forward with this for the community. The mobility master plan, it's a council goal, 2015. It really, we see this as the vehicle for resolving this issue. You've got a list of projects, you've got a 300 plus million dollar plan, you have growth targets. If you, if you approve this package, you're going to have things in ordinance. And once we address the public share, um, we'll be good to go. But to figure out how to do that, uh, we're going to really need a process first here the council then out with the community uh, we see the mobility master plan linking all of these different things together 
as the opportunity to do that and to truly have commitment from all of you and then commitment from the community that this is the right direction um, for all of us. And if that's not the case, either here at the council or out in the community at either, either step of the way, then we'll be back here and we're gonna have to talk about level of service, we're gonna have to talk about growth plans, we're gonna have to reassess one way or another because um, we, we cannot continue on um, without being fully committed to the plan, either this plan or a different plan. So, quick moment on building projects. Uh, there's been a little bit of talk out there about the city not building projects, and uh, I just want to remind everybody, we've been around since 1892, almost started to feel like a beer commercial when I was putting this together for some reason, but <laughs> Budweiser Clydesdale should come flying by or something, but yeah, 123 years, and everything that's here in this community, we had a hand in it being built. We either built it or we oversaw somebody else building it, and so we're very confident that if we have things in place, we have funding, which we haven't had in the past, we have a solid plan, and we have community commitment behind it, we'll do our jobs. We're professionals, we're here to build stuff, we're here to make the community uh, go, we're here to serve you, and uh, we will get it done. Uh, this is really the first phase of the, the funding for the central plan and where we're headed in the community's vision, and the public uh, portion of that is yet to come, the public share is yet to come. Uh, but that would be the next process. And this is also a significant portion of the plan. The mobility master plan will put the final pieces uh, into all this and provide some clarity on prioritization, but really the list of projects is all there. It will change over time, I will mention that. Every two to three years we're gonna update uh, the model and the result of that will be some tweaks and some, some alterations based upon uh, the development we've seen, what's happened in real time. Um, but I remind you, your votes represent the community commitment, at least right here, and they did on the central plan as well. Uh, and each step of the way, um, we're checking in with you as the representatives of the community to see if we're, we're dialed in correctly, uh, and, and we're, um, at least we're recommending we go with this. And so, the mobility master plan is really where it comes together, that's the last bullet. Can I make a, can, can yes. I make a comment? So, when you were talking before about growth, so I, I support, uh, I supported the Central Issaquah Plan, and I still do. Um, but um, I didn't support it because growth is inevitable and you have to have growth. Um, the Central Issaquah Plan um, addressed a number of things in the city um, that I, I, just speaking personally, um, I, I see benefit to, like, uh, you know, seeing the higher housing targets while keeping the commercial targets the same were, uh, uh, were partially in an effort to address things that I'm concerned with. But uh, I do worry that we need to, I think, pursue this from the idea that we have made these commitments and we're going to go about achieving those commitments. But some of what you just said was sort of like, it's always going to be this way. I mean, I just, I look at Mercer Island. Mercer Island has had essentially the same population for 30 years. So you don't have to grow. Um, we are doing that because we see a, a reason to do so. But you know, the next time targets come around, we as a city may push back, right? We may say we have done an, a, a yeoman's job of absorbing a lot of growth um, for 20 plus years. And so I just wanna make sure that, I mean, none of us will be on the council in 20 years, likely. And, um, but I, I just think it's important to understand um, the Central Issaquah Plan came about at a certain time for a certain set of reasons, and it isn't because we have to always accept tons of new growth, because like I said, Mercer Island is a wonderful place to live, and they have not stalled out because they've had the same population for 30 years, and we will eventually get there, right? We will get to a point where we won't want to grow anymore, and, and so you will slowly start to see Carnation and Duval and... Um, Snoqualmie and North Bend fill in, but they will fill in much more slowly because of the the numbers that we have taken on as a city and because of the growth management that this metropolitan area has. So I just, uh, it's not going to change what we do here today, but I just want to make it really clear. We chose what we did for the Central Issaquah Plan for a real specific set of reasons, not because we had to, but because it, we thought it would move the city in a, in a direction that we liked. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else on this one? So bottom line, this is just a recap of really what we've been talking about tonight. Transportation is the highest priority in the community. Uh, we talked about that right off, off the bat. Regional growth is a really significant factor. It's driving congestion more than our own growth. We're committed to growing, at least at this point. Uh, there are no feasible options for these 
regional trips, pass through trips, whatever we want to call them, but the trips that do not end or start here for them to pay their fair share. There are some options, but nothing really feasible that I think the council probably wants to discuss. Um, we're asking our own growth to pay its fair share. That's a big part of this proposal. That's, that's really what impact fees are about. This plan's been studied extensively. Uh, we believe it's balanced. We think we've really worked it through with you. And we need your continued commitment at this point uh, if we want to move forward in this direction. What's next? So next is next week, potentially, uh, adopting the amendments in front of you. Then the mobility master plan process, again, a 2015 council goal, and then building projects and delivering the vision. Questions? I have a question. I'm going to find a slide. You, um, on your slide on uh, what if no growth, right there, not an option, already vested development. Um, to just, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, let's, I want to make sure we, I, I have the correct and we all have a correct understanding of this definition of vested development. I know we've talked about it before, but it, I don't think it hurts to hear it again. So could you, uh, you know, there's, there are, there are um, development agreements. Correct. There are projects that are currently in the pipeline. Um, but could you just kind of you know, put some more color on what, what it means to have a vested, uh, you know, these are vested trips, I think, what we're talking about. Or is it vested dwelling units or vested jobs? My, my, yeah, there are a whole variety of things, and the team will probably chime in here as well, but my specific reference here, and it's likely broader, uh, was the development agreements that the city has. We were, we were contractually obligated. We've, we've sat down with the developer. We've approved it, and unless both parties want to mutually agree to something else, uh, we've committed ourselves to allowing certain types of development in certain locations in the city, and that represents, as I mentioned earlier, more than half uh, of our total future growth that, uh, that we have out there in the forecast. So that's a significant part of it. Randy, Dave, anything further to add? I, I think you've summed it up well. Um, going back to the data that Torsten shared with us in one of his slideshows about the trips that were internal and external and where they were coming from and how many trips, and there were about 30,000, 29,000 some odd trips. And we discovered that about 15,000 of those, 25,000, are trips that you've already committed to. You've committed to the trips because you've already committed to the development. That means the development isn't there now. This is future growth that's going to come from specific organizations that you've entered into contracts with. You've agreed that their proposed development is in a place you want, of the style and, and level that you want, and they're required under the old mitigation to do some mitigation, and so they're contracted for that. It isn't their fault and it isn't your fault that we didn't know before the Central Issaquah plan that it was going to be a dramatically different set of projects with a higher price tag and therefore a different share that they could have been asked to pay. They didn't know it. We didn't know it. Nobody got away free. We have a new look at what it's going to take to sustain the level of growth that we now understand is coming your way. And um, one of the numbers that we've all gotten real used to is the $119 million share that's associated as, we call it the city share, but it's the city share because it's the amount linked to that contracted development that's been approved that exceeds the commitment they've made to us to pay. And it isn't because they got a break. It's because we understood we had a much lower project cost. I think I can perhaps use some new vocabulary to put a better understanding on some old information for you. If you took that $119 million and divided it by the 15,000 trips that are associated with that, you're talking about $7,000, $7,500 a trip. Well, if you look at the amount that we've calculated for the impact fees and the bicycle pedestrian mitigation fees for new development that doesn't have a contract with us already, that's within a couple hundred dollars of what new development will pay. So if we had known before we entered into those agreements that's what it would cost now. We would have asked old development to con contract for that. 
we didn't, so now it's become our share, and it's our obligation to make sure that we have those projects funded to sustain the level of service that you want. That's why this has become a really complex conversation, because it isn't just as simple as grow or don't grow, or expensive or not expensive, or level of service good or bad. You start playing with any one of those, and it affects the others. Randy, can I ask you a question? The $119 million <coughs> you mentioned, you mentioned that that was the sh city sh city's share of the uh, contracted growth that is above and beyond. Um, is it all attributed to that, or is it some of that attributed to artificially low impact fees and um, other... I yeah, I think actually we're trying to say the same thing with different words. I would agree that they weren't, I wouldn't say that they were artificially low. But they were low because I developed those fees and Torsten helped me do it back eight years ago. And at that time, it was the entire list of projects for the entire amount of growth that you thought was coming your way using methods very similar to what we're using here. But because it was a much smaller project list, it was a much smaller fee. Well, we haven't had only contract growth. I mean, haven't we had other growth? No, the growth we've had has not been development agreement related growth. So Correct. I'm, I'm having trouble with the 119 million all being attributed to contract growth. Um, 119 million, hang on a second. You don't have all the other PowerPoints floated up, do you? Don't. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, now I, I can do a short version from a distance and we'll see if it rings a bell. Um, yeah. So we had the slides that had the little, here's the total and here's how it breaks out internal and external and here's the internal piece and how much is vested and not vested. That's the slide I'm referring okay. to, and I accept that nobody can read it. I can hardly read it from it. I'm right under my nose. But, but it is that one that we had in okay. the December um, eighth. Okay, so December eighth session. Okay. So it's broken down more. It's broken down into one nineteen and other. There's more than. Correct. Okay, I'll just go back and look at it. Thanks. Page eighty seven in the packet. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, Dave? Look like it. But I, I'm not, I want to make sure I understand that because the way you just characterized the question, uh, Stacy, I'm not sure I understood that. It's not that the share is driven by contact and growth. We can't say that. I don't think that's. But that's what I heard. Yeah, but that's, that's not what I heard. Okay. So, um, yeah, maybe if we could find that. Um, we started off, this is just the traffic piece, not the non-motorized. And we started off with a total cost of about $255 million. This is in multiple documents. It's in, for example, primarily in the rate study for the new impact fees. Um, and it is the basis for model run number three, which gets us the level of service, which is a weighted average of D, but six intersections at a year F. And so given that assumption of the growth that you've got, we certainly have had some conversation about whether we are supposed to assume that, but, but we, we started this taking the central Issaquah plan as a given. So if we continue to assume that for this conversation, not as a sales pitch, just how did we get there? And if you assume that that growth is properly loaded in an updated traffic model, we updated the traffic model, and if we tried to solve all the problems and it was prohibitively expensive and so we asked for permission to get rid of some TIP TI projects that were not helping level of service and to get rid of some projects that were prohibitively expensive, we got down to model run number three. So that's the $255 million cost. Thank you, Dave. Got it. And so we subtracted two things from the top. $6 million worth of existing deficiencies that we cannot charge to any new development. That has to be a city share. And then we subtracted $26 million in commitments from other development, including old other development, rally, 
for example, new other development that you've approved, Costco, okay, they're all in there. And clearly, as you recall from the Costco agreement, most of that money is from the more recent Costco agreement because it's based on the most recent cost per trip. We've got $223 million left that we have to figure out how to pay for. And of that, $41 million is associated with external trips. And since we don't have a cash register sitting outside their new development, we own that. That becomes part of the city share or as it's euphemistically called up there, other funding. And it could be other funding if we had more grants. Okay? And we talked in the funding strategies about how we actually have a substantial over $80 million worth of grant estimates towards that total. The internal side, these are the trips where there's at least one trip end it's generated in Issaquah. And of those $182 million worth of costs, that's what splits down below that into 64 million on the left and 119 on the right. The 64 million is the amount that we can collect from and estimate we will get from the new impact fee if you approve it because it's charging the full amount to, de to development that has not yet occurred and is not under contract to occur. It's not vested is the phrase we've all used with each other. The other fund side, that $119 million, that's the portion associated with the vested development, the development that's already been approved by contracts that we entered into as long ago as Rowley and as recently as um, Costco. Now, some of those trips are regional, okay? They, they come into, they're gonna, they become an internal trip where they land here, but they started outside of the city. That's why it isn't literally true to say that, oh, the external trips are the only regional trips. They're not. They're the through regional trips, but the internal end on a trip that started and comes to work here, or that started here because it lives here and goes to work somewhere else, that's part of our other fund share. Can I follow up hold on, on your hold question? Hold on, please. Okay. Nina. Then, then Mary Lou. Thanks. Uh, okay, Randy, to help me find a, uh, an amount, there are a certain number of projects in the pipeline that will pay an old currency fee. So it's not like they're paying nothing. Correct. So where is, is are they part of the 64? No, they're actually part of the 26 way up at the top. Okay. We took them off the top. That's, that's part of the commitments. Okay. Thank you. And the difference between what they are paying, which is in the 26, and what they, we now know they should have paid or could have paid or what we wish they paid is in the 119. Correct. The two combined would be the total items. Mary Lou? Sort of along the same line. If I were a, a resident watching this at home, <laughs> and there's probably some, and I could follow my way all the way through this chart, and that brings the number down a little bit. <laughs> this is so complicated. Um, simply tell me what the 119 is, if you had to break it into a pie chart and say some of it's because we didn't collect enough in the 26 million worth of commitments that are booked there to pay for it, but some of it is something else. Because if I'm a taxpayer, am I looking at that going, what growth did not pay for? Or are there parts, uh, more pieces to it than that in the 119 million? As I tried to mention briefly earlier, some of those trips have an external trip end and an internal trip end. And what you're seeing in that 119 million is our end of it, where they land here and go to work, or they leave here and go somewhere else to work. And so it's not strictly development that is internal, with some external trip ends associated with that, but it is all associated with development that we've agreed to under contract using old rates. So let me rephrase this. If you look at the 26 million up at the top of the table and we sold that number of trips, 18,000 or 9,000 at whatever the current going rate is gonna be, which is 6,000, 7,000, uh -huh. I can't remember. What does that pencil out to? Like, is that the majority of the 119 or part of the 119? I think another way to think about it is to add the 26 and the 119 together. 
that's 145. Okay? That's the total of the trips that are neither external, nor are they coming from future development. And of that 145, we've got a commitment of, of 26 million, and the other 119 million is not coming from that development we contracted with because they didn't know and we didn't know that we were going to have much bigger transportation needs. Hmm. Still doesn't quite get it what I, from a resident's point of view, what I'd be trying to figure out. So whether the trip starts in town, doesn't start in town, is that us not charging enough for a 15-year period that we ended up with, we now have to find 119, or is it a combination of things that make up the 119? A little bit of it is the disparity between what we were charging and what we're going to charge, but there are other components, or is that 119 just a growth number, just from growth, not from anything else but growth, and we didn't fund it over the last 10 years? Is that where that came from? As long as we can agree that the fact that we didn't fund it isn't a finger pointing activity, they didn't rob us and steal us blind, we didn't give away the farm, we didn't intentionally undercalculate, it was the best data that we knew eight years ago. And so they entered into contracts and we willingly entered into those same contracts based on those old rates. If that's the definition of we didn't fund it, then I would agree the whole 119 okay. million is that difference. That's why I said a few minutes ago, if you took the 119 million and divided it by the 15,000 trips that are associated with that, it's within a couple hundred dollars a trip of what we're proposing to charge new development. Okay. If we could now go back and charge them in the future, if they didn't have those contracts, then they would have to pay that same amount and it would pay for all of that. So it's the 119 plus 26. It's the balance. The 119 is the balance. The 119 and 26 is kind of the, the growth share. Yeah. The 119 and the 41 is the piece that the city has to pay for. Because mm -hmm. we don't have to pay for the 26. That's why it's green on this chart and it's not yellow. Green is development paying, yellow is somebody else, which means we're in the lead. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm just searching for that same thing, I, you know, starting with Stacy's characterization and then what Mary Lou just went through is like, there is, um, there, uh, we, you know, we had plans, uh, we engaged um, organizations with development goals and objectives, we reached agreement uh, and we used the accounting available to us at that time. And um, with, the, with the factors we're now using, growth targets, for example, uh, we have a new count, we use a different, we have new numbers for the accounting, and um, the 119 is the balance uh, of, of our share using the new accounting. So, I, so, I, so I, I'm just trying to get it straight in my mind. I think I'm getting a little back to what Stacy said: is that if, if growth, um, uh, uh, the existing vested growth really in the new accounting has an has a share of 145, there's still 119 that we have to account for. Right. Okay. They're paying about 20 percent. Can I ask another question? Mm -hmm. So, um, is this unusual? So, we a city embarks on this exercise, and we get. Um, I, mean, I, I think of concurrency and impact fees, and like you know, it's kind of constantly on the table. Um, as you know, you're always updating, playing a little bit of catch up. Projects get more expensive. You know, you agreed to some sort of growth years ago under some contract. Um, now we're looking at this some years later, the projects that are included in these figures are more expensive than they were several years ago. Um, and there's a, um, maybe for folks watching at home, sometimes an element of surprise and that's, well, those are large numbers and how do things get away, get away from them? 
you know, those people on TV. And so, I, I mean, and you've done a lot of work, you know, for many, many years in the area. And so, how, I mean, this exercise that we're going through, how unusual is it for a city to, you've got this, you know, large share that you need to figure out a way to pay for yourself because of A, B, and D? It's not very typical. I wouldn't call it extraordinary or unique or you're the only city, but there certainly is not a large number of Western Washington, Central Puget Sound cities that are in the same situation you are, that such a large percentage of your future development has already been spoken for contractually. And it's because of the, you, you're thinking in your experience because of the DA, development agreements. Yes. You know, and, and why and how those got entered into, you'd have to ask the applicants why they proposed and why they thought it was in their best interest to contract for those numbers. Maybe they thought they were high at the time. Maybe they thought it was a bargain. We can't get inside their heads. We know that uh, as a city government, as a whole, administration and council together, collectively approving those development agreements, they made sense at the time to the people who were in office at the time. Mm -hmm. I think that we have a great track record of people of goodwill occupying those offices. So. I don't think it's, I don't hear anybody doing any finger pointing and I don't think it's useful to, sure. but, but we certainly have seen a much more substantial, statistically substantial change in growth and in the cost of projects happen to Issaquah than has happened in other communities relative to the amount of growth that had been previously contracted. Interesting, thank you. Mary Lou, the mayor. Um, I'll also ask a, a question based on your experience. Is, um, it seems to me that Issaquah has really tried hard to be forward thinking and to plan where we want the growth. And I think in 20, 30 years, it's going to be magnificent. But I feel now that we're in an interesting position of where we're getting ready to make big decisions. And there's a lot of things that can make you uncomfortable about this. Are there other things about Issaquah, based on your experience with other jurisdictions, that might explain why we ended up where we ended up? For example, we've signed development agreements because obviously there are large developers who believe this is the place to be. I mean, I, other cities aren't necessarily getting that, but we, we have it. They wanted to come here and we said don't talk to them. So when you compare our city to other cities, are there other factors that have sort of put us in this spot where we're all kind of squirming a bit, but you know what, it makes sense because Issaquah is unique because it's different how from these other cities that don't have the DAs, that don't have the committed uh, development proposals already coming. So you might remember one of my earlier presentations to you. Um, reluctantly went down the road of comparing our proposed impact fees to those in other communities. And I insisted on, and you were kind enough to let me deliver my sermon, which is, <coughs> please don't go there, because there's no way to compare any two cities. And I'm reminding you of that previous speech because I'm about to give it again. Um, but I'm just going to say, remember that speech? Ditto. I won't give you the whole speech. I can't give you an answer that says, oh, here's what's different about Issaquah because everything is different about Issaquah, but it's not because you're different than 80 other cities that are all identical to each other. It's that all 81 cities are wildly different than each other in every way, shape, and form. Charlie mentioned in one of his slides the, the geography. We've got mountains, we've got a lake. Well, we're not the only one with mountains and a lake, but we are also have a huge pass-through traffic. We've got a major interstate freeway and other regional transportation facilities, and then our school system, housing stock, people that you are, you, you know, people like to live here, you're good neighbors, um, you could go on. And th at the end of it, I would wind up saying what I'll just say now, I'm unable to answer your question because I can't zero in on a couple of key components and that's it, that's why that happened. I would if I could, I don't have that ability. Nina? I have two things. I'm going to want to go off of what Stacy and Mary Lou have said, and also what we've said earlier that um, this the level of discomfort that that I feel knowing the city obligation that we're facing. 
uh, you know, well, when did that, when, you, when you're traveling on the path, when did that happen and how many undos can I, you know, how many control Zs can I do to get back to where I don't owe that money? And, uh, and we talk about when we made commitments in which things could be undone. And one of the things along the process, and I'm just going to try to uh, summarize what I understand and then without uh, misleading anybody, but because I think I understand it, is that when part of the step is um, updating hmm. amounts, the other part is how we charge the fees and going from, um, I wish I could remember the terms, but going to the simplified plan. And it seems like it's the simplified plan that creates the burden, the obligation, the liability that we're saying, we're going to do all this, that there's an all of this to do, rather than when a, a new development comes in and says, hey, we're going to do this much, and we're going to say, oh, there's an impact, and it costs this much. How does the, well, let me put it this way, how does the simplified, and I'm not saying we're going to erase that part, but how does the simplified create the obligation or a liability? Um, I see it through a different lens. Um, I don't think that simplifying concurrency and creating a trip bank and a substantial fee that goes along with that trip bank has caused the cost of the fees to be high. Oh, that's not what I mean. Okay, try again. I mean that instead of one development coming forward and saying, I'm going to make impacts, how much does it cost? We're planning what all the growth will be. We're being very strategic and holistic and then we're dividing it up. But eight years ago, when I did your transportation impact fee, we had a list of projects costing tens of millions of dollars that were based on that comp plan's version of all the growth you were gonna get, okay. and it was all the transportation projects we thought you were gonna need, and we came up with a fee. Um, I would remind you that that fee got cut in half within a year because one of the biggest projects that was contributing to it was taken off the, the, the table for a variety of perfectly good reasons. But it turns out, even if that project wasn't the right project, the amount of money for it probably should have been retained, and that was the bypass. Okay. So maybe we don't want the bypass, maybe we don't need the bypass, but we needed the capacity somewhere in the system. And after we'd done all the modeling, and all the calculations, we simply went back and removed it, but we didn't replace it with anything else. Okay, so yeah. Ina, is your question whether the simplified concurrency somehow created efficiencies? No. Okay. Uh, uh, what I'm, if, uh, could we just increase the fee? Could we just not say we're doing simplified and our fees were too low before and now they're gonna be this much uh, in and how would that change how much the city share is? Is there, it, I'm not trying to rewrite it, I'm just trying to identify when did it, when did this happen? Randy, <laughs> Randy, if I, if I may, I, I think for me, if I'm listening to your question carefully, the aha moment for me was probably 2013 when, you know, I was rel still relatively new on the council and our concurrency is not tied to our strategic plan for how we want to grow and manage our city. I couldn't believe that. That knocked me out of my chair. Uh, there was no coupling between our strategic plan and the actual mitigation that development and growth was contributing to the city. And, and that's the way I view this now, is that we have a strategic plan and, and, and we have mapped concurrency to, in a way, to help us actually execute that plan. That's the way, I, and I, that might be an oversimplification, but that's the one way I view this. Yeah, so I cut you off, Randy, I apologize. No, I, I, I think your way of expressing it is excellent. Um, try and give a similar answer from a different direction, but it's, it's looking at the same picture and just focusing on a different part of the, the picture. Um, if we didn't change concurrency at all, and we required new development from this day forward to continue to come in and turn in big traffic studies and send their traffic model to our traffic modeler and my modeler can beat up your modeler, and then we agree on five intersections that are broken and three of them they cause to be broken and so we make them mitigate, 
but the level of their mitigation is a turn lane or an acceleration lane. That's it. Um, the only defense we would have left is to come forward with our new impact fee and say, okay, that's how you do concurrency and it's complicated and expensive, but you still owe us these new much higher impact fees because we have determined, even though we've now separated it from concurrency, we've determined that we still need those transportation improvements. And what we really want you to do is to pay our full mitigation fee and in addition mitigate specific intersections that you might break. Okay, I uh, appreciate that. I think we're at a point where we can, uh, I wanna go on to the next phase of the meeting and um, a lot of good questions. So, okay, so. Very brief, we just, one thing we talked about this last time we didn't have the answer and I looked it up was for residential units. I just wanted to contribute Share to that. that. Yeah, sure. We were talking about a growth rate of 5,500 under the Growth Management Act and 7,754 the regional growth center. In the 2010 census, the housing units in Issaquah were 13,281. And I, I couldn't quickly find on my phone what the 2014 update was. I know there's one out there, but I saw a 2013 a population estimate update. It was a 10% increase. So if you extrapolate, we have about 15,000 residential units in Issaquah Highlands. But I don't have the, I'm, I'm making some triangulations to get to that number, but that doesn't sound reasonable to you. That helps give the basis of what the 5,000 growth is going on top of. We know. You meant citywide, right? Citywide. Yes. You might have something to add to that. You have something better? Because that was just an unanswered okay, question I wanted to get right. out there. This is, you know, earlier we had that table. What is the 14,640 units shown in that bar chart? And that comes out of the comprehensive plan that you okay. adopted. So it's how many? 14,640 is the total of units as of. It was pretty close. <laughs> I know you were. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's why we did that com comparison table of the comp plan to the model to demonstrate that while they weren't identical, they were within a few hundred of each other so we could go forward. Okay. <clears throat> All right, thank you for that. You know, it's good to explore these. It's, um, I appreciate that everyone recognizes that we don't take any of our decisions and our upcoming votes lightly, and it is critical, and it's our obligation uh, to really vet these and have a good understanding because voting out of convenience, is, is, is we're not asked to do that. We are asked to, to really understand and study and, and, and make a uh, decision based upon you know empirical data and our own assessment and, and judgment and listening to others, so I appreciate that. Um, the next thing I wanted to do was there in the packet there are many sections, but there are the actual changes themselves. Uh, in an earlier, um, yeah, in the earlier, uh, the actual action will be based upon some uh, code changes and, and an ordinance. Uh, and earlier there we uh, at another uh, meeting we uh, looked at the policy matrix. And um, there's been some updates to that, nothing major, but, I, but uh, what I wanted to do is just give everybody an opportunity. I know, I know you've all read it and had it memorized. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, we're not gonna have a test, but no, I just wanna, I just wanna, I just wanna just go through real quickly. So, so um, there's a lot said in there. There's, just, there's, there's the administration recommendation and then there's the council kind of agreement or not, you know, most, you know, uh, with those policy decisions. And I wanna make sure that there's not any on, uh, we have, we've vetted any type of concerns, all concerns or questions that people have about that policy section of the document. It starts on page, I mean, all you have to do is look it up. It's in the, um, it's uh, on page 31 where, uh, and it goes for, you know, a number of pages. It goes for um, about eight pages. Yeah, it's on page 31 of 290 of the, P of the PDF. Now I don't, you know, and we did, and in fact, a couple meetings, a couple months ago, we went through all of these mm -hmm. and I just wanna circle back. I just wanna check in. This is, this is, a, this is your, an opportunity to, to get clarification to make sure uh, this document reflects what this council believes. Mary Lou? Sure, first of 
first a comment. Um, I did miss the December 8th meeting um, and uh, went back and listened to the tape. I think I have 25 minutes to go. It's certainly a very long meeting. But I think this policy document, the way it's organized, is excellent. I found it, I just wanted to, the comment is that I just wanted to tell staff that there's a lot of policy items that showed up in this decision that we're going to make, and the way it's organized here and used as a tool in your discussion last time, I found very helpful. Also, I listened to your conversation and looked at all of the, the document, as well as whether or not it was recommended by the majority of council or not, and I didn't have any questions or um, anything to ask about it. I was in agreement, more or less, with what you guys landed on last time. Okay, thank you for that. Nina? Uh, thank you. On uh, page 32, section C, where it says growth in Issaquah, uh, just one observation. Uh, it's not a, a complaint, it's an observation. Number two, uh, the way that that policy says um, regular traffic model updates every two to three years, comma, as needed, uh, is interestingly phrased because what I was concerned when I read this is that it might fall into the uh, perpetual non-updated um, condition. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm jumping ahead when I say that I was glad to see some um, revisions in the code mm -hmm. that put the words shall. So I know we're not talking about code right now, but this does not indicate how the code was, was updated. It might be nice to say so. Just a thought. Okay. Okay, but yeah, but the code does reflect this policy and also, I mean, you're, you're satisfied yeah. with that. Well, the code in, is in, better than right, this. Right, yeah. right, Okay, yeah. all right. Josh? Um, in section J on the changes of use, we had a visit from a representative from Master Builders at the infrastructure meeting. He had uh, an interesting hypothetical at the last meeting, and I didn't capture all the details of it, but I'm hoping that one of you might have. And I think we said that perhaps that could be addressed at tonight's meeting. It, it had to do with the change of use situation where he used the landing and Renton as an example, where the developer just was unable to get that type of mm -hmm. retail or housing or whatever it is they were trying to build because of economic conditions. And so he was concerned that something would would sit vacant for a period of time through no fault of the developer's own, and then they'd be doubly hip with impact fees. And I'm, I'm probably butchering his hypothetical, but it was it was something that we hadn't really touched on in that change of use. Actually, I think he did a, a fine job of summarizing what we also heard him say. So we all heard that, whether that's exactly what he said or not. Um, we took that back as a team and talked about it. And we reminded ourselves that the code, as we've got it, framed right now for your adoption um, continues the um, the one year period in which a building can be vacant and within that first 364 days go ahead and go forward and, and not be required to pay any fees um, and that if it is simply a change of use of an existing building it's not going to pay to change the fees we heard the concern that was expressed and on reflection our um, conclusion was for your consideration that it's really not the city's business to try and anticipate every possible risk-taking activity in the private sector and the losses that they might incur and that it might be sad for them and sad for our local economy if a building sits empty for two or three or five years but simply extending the deadline by which that particular kind of a development um, could then escape paying any uh, fees didn't seem to be warranted by public policy, and it further burdened, would either further burden the city to pay for that difference or, or give up that, that amount of money, uh, <laughs> or, or would put us in a position of going back and then charging for changes of use, which we've all taken from your <laughs> comments that we want to get out of that business because we have not been paying people back when they've had a reduction in trips. So, so th th that's a long-winded, we have intentionally not offered you the master builder's requested change. Appreciate that. 
Do you have any other questions, Josh? Um. That, that was it on that topic. I just wanted to follow up from our committee discussion. Yeah, and, and I have, um, I, I was, of course, at the committee, and I, my memory is just a little bit different. Um, um, you know, Josh, I, I don't recall there being a claim of no fault of their own. Um, I think this idea that, um, you know, there, if somebody's business <coughs> speculation didn't uh, pan out, um, that like, that's no fault and we should have, we shouldn't. I mean, cause I, it, because I think the, 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 the code as we're considering right now, if 12 months go by, uh, and then there is a change of use. There is a change of use. Then, you know, somebody's seen something a little bit different and they're <coughs> gonna make an investment into that property. So, so I think, um, you know, that, that was just, you know, and, and so I, I, do, I do agree with this. I, th I think there's, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the vacant for a year, it's, we're not inventing that type of um, m uh, measure. Uh, it's an adopted policy already, and so, um, yeah, and I, when I heard that, I thought, listen, if it doesn't work out, and then somebody some a year later wants to change the use, an existing owner, uh, and it's vacant for a year, uh, finishes, gets that building occupied, and it's not a change of use, there's no impact. Okay, can I also remind council that that one year period is not just a whim, it's not a political, gosh, well, we think that's fair and beyond a year is too long and less than a year is about right. It's actually based on the technology and the, and the methodology underlying our traffic modeling. As we update the traffic counts on a regular basis, so we know the trips are coming out of development that's occupied and are not coming out of vacant development. And when we accumulate our quarterly counts on an annual basis, if the property's been vacant for a whole year, our annual summary then says there wasn't any traffic coming out of there. And so we no longer had to account for what happened at local intersections and on our streets. Now if somebody comes along after that year and proposes to put traffic coming out of that same driveway, that's new traffic to us. And so that's why we feel they need to contribute. Okay. Mary Lou. Um, I can wait until you've gone all around. Yeah, I thank you. Totally Tolda, you. did you have anything in the section, Stacy? Did you? Okay, Mary Lou, thank you. Um, so one question I, I did forget, but just got reminded of was um, in J5, um, certain projects with established budget and the permit pipeline may be grandfathered under the appropriate fees. So I know there's been some, it's, it's written in the draft ordinance and it's written in the regu draft regulations. But if we have um, 23,000, 24,000 trips that are either vested or in the bank to be sold, what portion of those trips is in the projects that are reflected in the current draft language? What, how many trips or dollar value, or what's associated with that? In, ter in terms of the trips, they were already excluded from the model when Torsten took into account the list of projects. Th these were also included in the ones that so were So if the tested. number of, if the capacity that we have left is around 24,000 trips, the model just dealt with, like, I'm just going by, Maybe I've got the numbers wrong, but something that I heard earlier, I thought we have X amount invested already, and then we have 8,000 to sell, approximately. Right. The, 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 that chart up there doesn't have the trips on it, but right. the, the left green box, the $64 million figure, is about 8,441 trips, right. okay? And the other funds trip is the other 15,000, totally So are the trips 000. that are covered by 0.5 in the draft language that we have right now not included in the 24,000? They are included in the 24,000. They are included in the 15,000 that are on the others. So how many, how many trips is that? Out of that total? That is reflected in the current language in the draft ordinance. It's, it's like, like 600, 650, approximately. Or less, yeah. Like the multiple. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, probably more like f 500. about 500. 500? And that's how many development projects? Twenty-one. 
and the staff has done the research and so they have a list it's not like we're going to invite applicants to come in and go well would you like to be on our list i mean you either are or you're not and I, I guess I missed the part of the discussion that changed the date. So why did the time stop, I guess? Why did the, <laughs> the time period allow for them to apply for a building permit get extended? So between uh, the last infrastructure committee meeting and this meeting, we had a discussion with master builders. And we had a request from them and had a discussion with the administration uh, amongst all of us. And the request was for a six month delay. Uh, at the tail end of the process. We heard from master builders that a number of the builders, they felt uh, their members could not get permits, uh, building permits uh, uh, finalized in time. Uh, that, that even though we tried to create a window to help these projects in the pipeline, we weren't actually accomplishing that. And so they asked for another six months and uh, it's our recommendation to grant that. What amount does that represent? What does that add? What is it? How many additional, what, what are we capturing additionally by adding that six months? Nothing? No, the difference is $3 million. That's the total? So the different, the, the estimated total uh, impact fees that would not be collected as a result of that is $3.1 million. You're a different question though, aren't you? Aren't you asking the difference between uh, if we didn't, do they have estimated building permit issuance dates? Like the difference between we have, what is it, five, 500 trips in the pipeline. If we extend it, all 500 get used. If we kept it the way it is, only 350 would get well, used. I think it's the same question. It's just a matter of how you want to answer it. It's, it's, I mean, you have those trips. Either they're going to pay, they're going to pay one fee or another. Yeah. And so what's the, I guess, lost opportunity, so to speak, if you extend it. And you're saying 3.1 million. Yes. yes. We, we think this is a better solution than what some cities have done, which is to extend the implementation date for the entire program, because mm. that lets anybody new walk in the door who hasn't made any previous progress and also qualify for a delay if they can get their application in quickly enough. This targets specifically people who've already taken action. Anybody else who hasn't gotten that far, they need to face up to the new program. I thought you had done a pretty good uh, according to what we heard before, you've done, you've done a pretty good analysis of um, justifying which projects would be vested not, and not necessarily legally vested. And so, um, just so I'm not, I'm not convinced uh, with the six month delay. I'm gonna have to think about that. Just to be clear, it's not a three point four million dollar difference with the six month delay. That's just the total amount of those projects. Correct, Dave? The, the, it's not the six month delay that, that results no. in that. It, that's oh. the total amount of impact fees that could be collected from the all of those projects that we combined. Don't get we're for simply all of them. Three correct. We're it's simply giving them an extra them. six months to get their building permits completed. So is there a difference with the six month delay? There likely will be uh, more projects on that list from which we do not collect, but the likelihood of us collecting 100% of all of these um, under the new fees is, uh, I think, very low. I think we'll see some of these come in. Yes. Right. Are we all understand? Yeah, the, del the delta is 3.1 million between the old fees and the new fees. So if they pay under, the, but it, odds are they're not going to all fit on one side of the fence or the other side of the fence. There's going to be a blend. Giving them six more months means it's more likely that more of those projects will be on the old fees yes. than the new fees. That was that was the request from Master Builders. So All we get on the other do side. What we can to give them a fair chance to get in. We didn't feel that six months was a fair chance. In old fee numbers, they pay about a million, a little under than that. And if none of them qualify, they all pay four million. Hence the difference of one point three point one. Nina. Yeah, I think you just answered. So the most. Is 3.1 million, although it's possible or even likely that many of them won't get even with the extension. And I'm, I'm glad for this discussion because this was a, a um, something that was not clear to me early on was the magnitude of the <coughs> difference between the parties who hadn't yet completed all their application processes and since concurrency 
uh, is not paid until the, the building permit, it seemed like there was a big gulf there. And when we were talking about 118 and it hadn't been uh, clear, clarified to me, I'm, I'm relieved, I don't want to say only 3.1 million, God forbid, but it's, it's less than I thought it was going to be. And I, um, I'm not unhappy to hear that. And to add to that, one project will probably pick up its building permit in the next week or two. That's the seventh Gilman. That's one and a half million of the three million we're talking. Big chunk of <coughs> Okay. Anything else about this section? Okay, let's move on to, I want to take us down to the um, code amendments. It's section eight, starts on page 93 of 290 in the PDF. Um, this is the actual change to the code. So this is, when I said change earlier, I meant change to the code, not just changes in the document. Uh, this is what actually would be getting implemented. Now we had an opportunity, is there, and I, I think there's a few tweaks in there. We looked at this last week and had uh, in committee and had some changes. Are there, I think there are some updates <coughs> since color. then. So just for everyone else's benefit at infrastructure, we uh, yes, had an opportunity to look at this. Yeah, if you could, yeah. if you could, of what was changed since last week and then. Randy jokes that the new color is gray. <laughs> <laughs> it really yeah, is, it's yeah. highlighted in gray. There it is, yep. And the code amendments are summarized in the briefing paper just pages four right, and right five front, of the whole right packet. Front, yeah. So I guess to start, number one, um, there was a request at CIC to talk about 300 trips, at, that no more than 300 trips outside the central plan, um, that we codify that and really commit to that number in the code. So we've added that in, in the code here. So, so that's a really important point. I mean that, so this whole 2,500 trip ends of, of, and I mean, I should say of the balance of 8,400, there's only 300 of that 8,400 that's not in the central area. And so projects could come along and they want to be outside the central area and, you know, we've only got 50 trips less in the, left in the bank and someone has a project for 100, well, we can't, <coughs> they can't, they're going to have to change their plan. So this is, again, it's just, it's, it's an interesting number. It shows the proportion of what we're talking about where it is relative to the central area. 300 of the 8,400 are, or 8,100 of the 8,400 are in the central area. And can I add, we clarified for the infrastructure committee um, that the, another provision that we have of the 50% reduction in trips from the bank triggers an update. Mm -hmm. You're not applying that 50% to 50% of the 300. So all 300 trips could go away, and we could still have 80% of our 8,400 trips. We would not be triggering a new study just because those 300 trips got used up outside the Central Issaquah area. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dave. Second one is, I'm, we're, I'm just trying to still figure out, on the online packet, yeah. is this labeled as View Agenda Bill 6876, the one that has the gray revisions? You recall at the committee meeting, I got totally turned around on which yeah. deadline we were looking at. Yeah, it's page but 95 of today's meeting packet. Uh, we've, we have, that's in the PDF version. And yeah, that's what I'm saying, that's what I'm saying. Folks are looking in the HTML version mm -hmm. of exhibit attachments, is that what you're getting at? Yeah, I'm just on the council work session agenda that's posted online, December 8th, HTML. And there's a series of HTML links this is code amendments attachment eight. Code amendments in the legislative in parentheses. Attachment, no, they're not numbered, unfortunately. Post amendment. Sorry, yeah, to sorry the, to hold it up. I'd go to the PDF or go to 93. Yeah, I'm gonna try to use the PDF then. It's just, if anyone's trying to follow along, oops. Okay, now I'm on the PDF. It's 257 pages. Is that what we're working off of? 90. 190 pages. December 8th. You're looking at December 8th. We're looking at. Yeah, I don't have a paper copy here. I'm using our website that we post to the public. 
Yeah, and it's yeah. So I'm I got my mine in the same location. The PDF mm -hmm. is is right there as well. That's what I did. It's Facebook the same thing. Yeah. It's the same document. It's just one document. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. Misspoke. It's yeah. not the December eighth. It's two ninety. That's today's date. It would be on January tonight's 12. January twelfth yeah. agenda. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody had said December. Look at the December. Okay. I, I blew it. My bad. <laughs> now I'm now I'm with you. Two ninety. <laughs> So, so where were we? Um, we're going to talk about change number two, 50 percent, you know, a greater guarantee in the code. I think we talked about it earlier that right into the code when 50 percent of the trips are no longer remaining in the trip bank, that will automatically trigger an update of the traffic model in the bank. We've been saying approximately every two to three years. so. Um, what page is that one on? That is on page one eight. Does it look like there was a change before that on ninety nine? Are you following a different order? On page ninety nine, there's a gray area as well about changes in building use. It might be easier for us to follow it in the order that they are changed in the code. Oh, through the code document? Because mm -hmm. I think most people now are looking at the code document. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Now you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're on page nine. If you want, yeah, on page 99, that is the change um, that addresses the change of use discussion we had. That if, if the person is vacant more than a year, that um, the applicant development pays the full impact fee. Okay. That's on page 99. So on that one, yeah, Josh. It now says the expansion of a building and a change of use after more than one year. Correct. And, and I mean, change of use didn't necessarily mean expansion of a building. In fact, I thought it was quite the opposite. It was <clears throat> no expansion to the building, but just a change of the existing facility. I think it's the way that we try to build off the existing text, but it, that last sentence, it's in green and gray, would mean that if, if the person expands or changes the use after one year, then it is subject to this chapter, and subject to this chapter means the impact fee. So I think you need an either or. Either the expansion of a building or a change of use after more than one year is subject to this chapter. Okay, not and. Okay, just do an add an okay. either or to that sentence and it'll make exactly what you want it to say. Fetch. Thanks. So if we move along um, in order to page 102, Talk. Mm -hmm. And you remind me that this this was the one this is some wording we found well, the, the, the infrastructure committee actually raised the question the concern that we were using a trigger point or we were using a process by which the decision even just the analysis of whether or not we think we ought to update the impact fee studies was a council decision. And so what we've changed this to is an administration responsibility to make an evaluation and report to the council if they wish to do the update, council still authorizes the update. We also added into this language, again, in the spirit of the being clearer about the two to three year time period, a specific requirement that if the administration doesn't request an earlier update, then the three-year period will automatically trigger the update. Right. And you're going to find this language uh, similarly used not only here for the traffic impact fee, but also for the park impact fee and comparable language for the um, SEPA mitigation uh, stu uh, nexus studies. So as we page through that, you'll see that same language. Yeah, right. right. So I'm, now I'm just paging through the text here. Looking for gray? Looking for gray. <laughs> oh, Nina, go ahead. Should we adjust these as they come by? Sure. So, uh, as I said earlier, I, I appreciate the uh, use of the word shall. 
for every three years. But one thing that, uh, and it's a bigger topic, I want to bring it up now, maybe it's uh, discussed later, but uh, in the, the way that we're deciding things, we have the concurrency plan here, it's ready to be adopted or not, and then during the year 2015, we're going to be working on the master mobility plan, which is going to inform the strategy. You know, this, you, you wonder which uh, cart or horses or chickens or eggs or whatever. And then also, uh, we've discussed uh, when and whether uh, the voter approval for the funding uh, would happen. And I bring it up now because I just uh, want to ask my colleagues whether they think that um, having the three years a minimum of revisiting this will allow us to uh, reflect upon the results of those two major things back on this policy or if there needs to be some other trigger that once the master mobility plan is done, you should revisit the concurrency plan. I don't know, I'm just bringing it up because it, it is very hard to, to sequence very complicated topics which each inform one another. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, you know, there, um, the, the council can always ask for an update. This is triggering the administration just on to make sure that it doesn't go longer than three years to make a recommendation. Yeah. But there will, you know, compelling events based upon things that happen or don't happen, succeed or don't succeed. I mean, we always have that option available to us as a council. Mm -hmm. So again, what you're concerned about making sure it doesn't go, um, maybe minimum three years is too long? No, I'm not saying that no, it but is. What, what, no, but what, what's it? Sorry, I missed it. Oh, the, um, that, what is the it? Not the, <laughs> are you talking it's about an update. It? I took it as an update. Yeah. And, the, and the it is that the master mobility plan may bring forth considerations that would have changed the way we would do this code once we get there. But that happens to be the second in sequence. We have this now and we have that later. So how do we assure that the, okay, how about this? A rate, are you talking about a rate study or something? No, I'm talking about just the, um, the concurrency code. Mm -hmm. How do we, let me put it this way and see if this um, resonates. How do we make sure that the, that the concurrency is the, I'll call it slave, because I hang around a computer programmer all the time, to the master mobility plan and not the other way around? How do we know that when we get to the master mobility plan, people don't say, well, shoot, you've got this concurrency program and you can't change that, so you have to use that as your basis. But really, I think we want to go into the master mobility plan by saying, hey, we want to create a full strategy and that it would inform our concurrency. Hi, Mike. Go ahead, Randy. Um, so the particular section that we're on right now on page 102, since we're going through sequentially, deals with the impact fee. And as you speak about concurrency, um, for those of us technically inclined, we're thinking about the trip bank, mm -hmm. that it would need to be the thing that would be updated as a result of finding out new information from the master mobility plan. And at the risk of jumping ahead and then we'll go back, yeah. page 128 actually addresses that with some new gray language. I really am troubled by the fact that this is getting shades of gray. We always use that to mean <laughs> it's unclear. Mm -hmm. I may speak to Mr. Faber about not using that color in the future, but uh, there is a provision in the middle of, of uh, page 128 that clarifies rather more directly that if there's an update or amendment of the city's comprehensive plan, for example, um, as it relates to concurrency, that would trigger a required update of the trip bank. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so that's tying that together. Right. Okay. The other thing I would agree with, with Paul about is that these De deadlines the way they're expressed here are not later than. We must do this within three years. It doesn't prohibit or limit the council's ability or the administration's ability to move forward on an earlier schedule. This, this is meant to avoid what is happening right now, mm -hmm. where we've gone eight years without an update. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. okay. That's good. Thank you. So, just to follow up then, there's nothing really in here that talks about when the, the non-city share would get funded. And so then it, it sort of leaves that dangling out there as well. And we've, we've touched on this previously in work session in terms of, all right, we're not gonna, you know, 
force it to go out to the voters before considering adopting this. But once it's adopted, so you have this update and you look at your capacity and you look at your growth model and you look at that element of it, but what seems conspicuously absent is the funding aspect and some sort of trigger that says, if by this date we don't have the non-city share funded to whatever extent, that number up there, you know, we have 10% of that, 50% of that figured out, um, then maybe we need to take a look at this. And I, I, I don't know the right way to phrase that, but it just, it still troubles me out of all of this that we don't have the funding mechanism determined. And I, and I totally understand we don't want to determine it now, we don't need to determine it now necessarily, but somebody's gonna have to determine it because there's just no way we can get anything done to keep up with the rate of growth if we don't have it funded. And that money's not gonna fall out of the sky and it's certainly not gonna fall out of the Capitol Dome down south. So it's gonna be up to us and our citizenry to figure out that way. And, and I don't know where in here that aspect of it is, is also considered in terms of the review process. I'm gonna ask, uh, is it in here or is it in um, loop code, the burden of when you need to satisfy that by uh, concurrency law that you need to determine the source of funding? The timing of projects, the 10 years, the six years, the... Yeah, there's some language in the concurrency provision about uh, funding strategies have to be in place, yeah. right? Yeah. But we have a list of funding strategies. In place doesn't mean adopted voted on by the public and money in the bank. That, that doesn't answer Josh's point as, as to whether or not the council wishes to add to this document a self-imposed deadline or developing the funding strategies or something happens. Mary Lou? Just a, a comment back to Josh. It seems to me that you know, we think this is a highly desirable place and, and we want to see all these projects built and we want to sell these trips and get it done. But every year, there may or may not be anybody that comes to the table to build anything and give us any money. We still have a transportation issue if nobody comes. And so we still have to do a good chunk of this anyway. So to me, it's, I'm thinking if you go all the way to the end and have this really well thought out, well, intricate plan on how you're going to fund or finance this, every year you're going to revisit this very intricate plan because we just don't know who's coming or when they're going to come or what they're going to pay. So even if nobody's coming, we still have to have the master mobility plan for the people that are already here and the congestion we already have. So I'm not as uncomfortable as you are with not knowing how we're going to get all of it. I figure we're going to do the best guess of what we know and each year we will tweak it, but we have to be very flexible because we just don't know who's coming get or if anybody else is coming and if I could say I'm, I'm not saying we have some poison pill that says you know this whole thing falls apart if we haven't figured out funding by date X I'm just concerned about being able to take a look at where things stand and maybe three years just the the regular three-year cycle is sufficient for that purpose um, I mean are we gonna have this out to the voters in three years maybe maybe not we don't know at this point um, but it just seems like at some point we're going to go along this process and some future council is going to say, okay, we've got to do this whether we grow or not. We've got to have some transportation infrastructure developed. We've got to have some park infrastructure developed. And so what happens when folks are sitting around the table in five years or ten years and there's no additional revenue coming in? Well, there is additional revenue, but it's only a portion as paid by developers, and we're still looking, we, the city, are still looking for how we make up that gap. And, you know, how do we go back and revisit the levels of service and the other types of things that lead to the inevitable conclusion that we have to come up with, you know, that much money? I think we have to come up with the money anyway. I mean, I guess that's where I'm coming at, is it just to me is, we as a council should decide whether or not we're going to support this master mobility plan no matter what development comes. And so we're gonna go out to the public anyway. We're gonna, maybe we're not asking them for everything all at once, for sure we're probably not. Maybe we're going to the public several times. But we are, if we're committed to improving the congestion we already have, we're going out to them anyway. 
because we already have problems and we have to figure out how to pay for it. So I, I guess that's, I feel like you're getting hung up a little bit and I, I'm feeling a little more comfortable that future councils are gonna deal with this the way we are. They'll just take what they're handed in a given year and do the best that they can in planning. But if we're going to fix this, we're already going out. Regardless of this piece of it, we're already going to go out to the public, I think. Nina? Uh, I think I understand uh, what you're saying, Josh, and share some of your concerns. And uh, one of it is that when we um, get around to voting on this policy, there will be this expected long-term obligation that comes in if, ever, if everything happens. And how could we protect the uh, future planning with some interim steps that may inform or uh, prepare future city populations and councils so that they don't get backed up. And one thing I just brought up a moment ago is this expiration date of the developer's uh, contribution. If we don't build the concurrency, we have to refund there isn't there an, there's an expiration date that makes sure that it's supposed to assure that the project actually gets done and then there are some ramifications if it does not so what the law requires for the impact fee is that we spend each dollar that we receive within 10 years it's not a requirement that we complete the whole 255 million dollar project in 10 years is there a requirement that we uh, that the other funding portion be spent not in the statute. Aha, uh -huh. so it's just that we spend the impact fee. Correct. So then that liability has, that's a little less burden than what I was thinking it might be. I, you know, I guess one thing I, that I was thinking about, Josh, when you were talking about this is that we have some goals and objectives in affordable housing. And one way that we have addressed that is we have instituted something about getting a report card now. We want to know what our status is you know where do we stand today and we've tried to set up something so that there'd be a regular reporting so that we wouldn't be surprised by the oops you're 200 million behind or whatever I think that's what you're getting at so maybe something like that yeah my Mike I, I agree uh, it's unthinkable to me that there'd be any oops we took our eye off the ball I just think that's unthinkable and we have already committed ourselves, I think, taking this action with the Master Mobility Plan to put a strategic plan in place on how to go about this there. And I think, um, uh, so, you know, 2015 is now. Uh, it is it is one of our goals. And um, I, I, I just don't have that concern that <laughs> we're gonna take our eye off the ball. I mean, this is, but what we don't, and I think what's different, and what I'm looking forward from from and from the master mobility plan is, is uh, having a strategy around funding. We've had a list of projects. We've known what they've cost. We've had planned uh, growth in our uh, uh, in our comprehensive plan, but we never really had a plan. We've never had a plan for how we are going to address this. What particular tools and levers and actions. Uh, not only, and to me, we've been talking. You know, we, you know, at some point there may be an a, there will be an ask of our public, but uh, we've talked about this before. We have a strategy uh, about, um, um, you know, trying to influence the, you know, Olympia to give us more options, for example. So, let, you know, but do we? I mean, do we have the right strategy? Do we have a complete strategy? Uh, master mobility plan goes beyond just concurrency. Uh, we want to look at parking. You know, that's, you know, and where is that going to come from? It has the opportunity to look at uh, mobility related issues beyond growth impacted as well. Uh, it could be some of those regional corridors. So, what's our strategy of perhaps working regionally or with nearby jurisdictions on some of these other areas? So, so the scope of that, so, and so I'm, my sense is, uh, you know, and Nina, to your question, who's the master and who's the slave? Concurrency is about addressing impacts due to growth. Uh, and, but, and that's only, uh, but that is not the full, that is not the only issue when it comes to mobility that we have here within Issaquah. And it also doesn't have, and as you rightly point out, and I don't think it should be within the ordinance. I don't believe that there should be, or even within the code, 
uh, any details. To me, it's uh, about what we're going to do about funding. To us, to me, that's a work plan uh, that we establish based upon, uh, you know, the the um, yeah, developing a master plan. So I don't, I'm not, I don't codifying what we might do about and when we might do funding. I don't think is, I don't think it's necessary. I, I think it would be, I don't know, is it unprecedented. It's, it's not required in the statute. Other cities don't have, um, certainly don't have the poison pill version, and they don't even have self-imposed deadlines. They understand that the nature of outside funding changes, the natures of councils changes, and that there's always that group that's the ultimate source of pressure for you. And that's your constituents. You know, at some point, they get fed up with the transportation congestion enough to be willing to pay for the improvements, or if a majority of them decline it, then the rest of them have to live with the fact that we've just bought congestion instead of paying for it. So, so you have a, a question? Yeah, I guess, what, well, my, my follow-up on that is, I guess I'm concerned with the notion that our citizens are gonna get fed up enough that they want to improve transportation, because I'm hoping that we can address that before they get fed up. And, and it feels like we need to start now and start funding because as Mary Lou correctly points out, even if nobody buys a single trip from the bank, we are already behind. Absolutely. So yeah, we have commitment. the sooner we begin funding and funding mechanism, and I'm assuming then that, that the master mobility plan is step A in driving us towards that funding mechanism, although we've been told through this process what are the, the four or five available likely choices, maybe we'll learn something new in the, in the mobility plan. But my hope is that at the end of that master mobility plan, we will then be prepared to move forward on a funding package because by the time it gets approved and taxes get collected and you start design before you get to build, nothing's gonna get built to improve our infrastructure for quite a while. And every year we wait is another year down the chain. Yep. That's yep. all. Great. Okay. So I haven't spoken to this yet. Totally. Um, yeah, I, I don't think we're going to go away when this process ends this month, this month or next month. I don't think we're going to go away and, and pat ourselves on the back and then four or five years from now say, hey, hey, didn't we, didn't we talk about, didn't we have to come up with like 120 million bucks? I mean, this is, uh, this is a, okay, we have gotten ourselves behind the eight ball. First thing you figure out is how far behind the eight ball are you? And then you figure out what you're going to do to get out from behind the eight ball. And so this is a step in that. And and I don't feel that we need to um, put in any artificial constructs because we are just naturally going to be moving further along towards addressing this issue. There is not any council in the next number of years that isn't going to have this front and center as an important issue. So so um, I, I don't want to add any any language that, that would, um, I don't think we need artificial constructs to understand that we need to keep working on this issue. Thank you, Joel. So I think everybody's had a chance to comment on that topic. Let's go back to the actual code, the language in the ordinance. Are there any other um, questions or highlights that you, that from the council or highlights from the staff? Or just about all the code amendments that For the last change, yes. Make sure on the change of use one, it's in two places. It's also in the park impact. Yes. I just want to point that out in case. That. Okay. Okay. So let's then move on to the last portion, which uh, let's, it is the, uh, the actual ordinance itself. It starts on page 139 of the PDF of today's meeting packet, that being January 12th. It's not in track changes, so we're going to get a highlight, or has nothing really changed? Yes. And nothing has really There's changed. There's only one change, and oh, that's on is. page 144. And I thought of doing track changes. Apologies, I didn't. Uh, that's okay. One change. The is section good. 9 that talks about the six-month no. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. shift in deadline date of the pipeline projects. Okay. Two dates changed. That summary, I can give you more, but that's, that's it. So this, this, so this, so it hasn't changed since. No other changes. No other changes, but that one. Yeah. But in general, there's changes, but then there's the actual language in question. So or concerns, clarifications. Josh, you mm -hmm. have one. 
you, you might have mentioned this earlier. Where was the part about the the stuff, all the trips being in the central area except for 300? The section that you mentioned that earlier, and then I just I totally missed it. Back in the code, we're now. Oh, it's in the code. We're talking, no, sorry. we can go back there just okay. to answer your question because we moved to the ordinance. So, um, yep, it's my on. My colleague is struggling. It's on. Jeez, we'll get it here. Page <laughs> 128. 128 of 290. That's you, in the code. Can you section. give me the section number, Dave? 18.15.245E. In gray, we added. Second sentence: Up to 300 trips may occur outside of the central Isqua plan boundary. And I recall in committee we had talked about having some cross-reference. So is that sufficient, legally sufficient, or otherwise to ensure that when we use the word central Isqua plan boundary, we are referring to the adopted plan that was adopted on X date and the you know. So I thought of that. I checked, and the central plan has a boundary in the central Issaquah plan document saying okay. here is the central Issaquah plan boundary. Could have put in a reference to adopted on next date under ordinance URZ. And All right. I leave that to our city legal minds, but I always prefer more clarification and things like that so that there's less potential for confusion so okay thank you yeah, we'll add that. okay so back to the ordinance any say any requested uh, language changes or questions or clarifications okay not seeing any um, at this point, I was going to ask if any member of the audience wanted to make any <laughs> comments, but the only gentleman who was here left. <laughs> yeah, <what is> that? <clears throat> so um, that's all we had tonight. Anybody else? Anybody uh, want to make a speech? A point of order. Josh wants to make a speech. I don't want to make a speech. Okay. I've, I've made question plenty, question and there will be plenty more okay. to come. Uh, but point of order. Um, the infrastructure committee referred this back to the next council meeting. So at this point, the bill is out of committee and it will be back before the council on regular business, is my understanding. The committee did not make a recommendation on the bill itself because we were essentially referring that action to tonight's discussion. So that is my procedural understanding of where we stand. Um, is that the bill will be coming back to the full council without a committee recommendation, but we've all had an opportunity through this process to reach consensus. That, that is correct. So, you know, so based upon what I've heard, and unless anybody has t uh, any final comments uh, to the contrary, I think this is, you know, ready f to come back in front of the full council a week from tonight on the 19th of January for potential action. Week from tomorrow, tomorrow night? Oh, yeah, that's right. Thanks. That's right. Okay. We have a holiday on a week from tonight. Thank you. It is, it is the 20th. Thanks for that clarification. Well, thank you, everybody, for your, uh, for your time this evening. You know, I think this was, hopefully this was a good review, Charlie, and uh, thank you for kind of setting the stage. It's a good basis of, that we you know needed to you know touch back to and um you know we've, we've